Bonjour. And so, Kadishnika, Shage do dem, we sing donjba, and a schnabe in Dao. My schnabe name is Anzo Ked, a storyteller uh, from Nipsing, First Nation, from the Crane clan of the Shabgizhik family, also of the Nishnabek nation. My uh, English name is uh, Perry McLeod Shabgizhik. I work for Nijan Sinonic Child and Family Services, and uh, I am the uh, manager of cultural services at the agency. Perfect. Um, so I told you a little bit about the program or the fun, uh, research that we're doing. Um, so very, it's a very broad question, and I can go in depth if you prefer. Um, but from your perspective, uh, what is Indigenous education to you? Indigenous education used to be uh, experiential learning, where you, you learned from doing and watching, listening. Um, wasn't a lot of uh, conversation, although there was, there was that. But it was more about experiencing what you were learning about. Um, today, it's a balance of both experiential learning and intellectual learning. So you're combining or balancing Western style of learning, classroom, lecture, um, technology, uh, along with uh, that experiential learning of doing uh, learning through being immersed in, in the, the subject that you're learning about. Okay. So from your perspective, uh, what knowledge do you think is important to pass on to um, current and future generations? Well, that's a pretty broad question. <laughs> in terms of the education style? Indigenous education, okay. so whether that be what you put forth or what yeah. knowledge should be. Well, two, two things. That uh, if it's Indigenous education, that it be a balance of experiential learning and intellectual learning. That there's always a balance of that. And that's the first part, that there always should be, you know, out of the classroom learning. There should be uh, learning where they're doing and learning through that but also that every person has their own learning style. So it has to be more catered to the student as well. So each person learns in their own way. So, you know, and Indigenous education, that was acknowledged, that was taken into consideration. So it's kind of looking at it as a collective, but also looking at it as an individual learner. So that's something that I think is is important. And I guess the third thing is that Indigenous education should not be only for Indigenous students. It needs to be for all students so that non-Indigenous students can learn about uh, the history, the ways, the thinking, the worldview of Indigenous peoples. So there's a better understanding between the two. I think Indigenous people, through education, have learned a lot about Western worldview. But there's been a lack of that Indigenous worldview being learned by the non-Indigenous uh, learner. So in what ways do you personally, um, as a knowledge keeper elder, what do you feel like you pass on through that, through the knowledge that you carry? Um, well, I can, you know, as a, well, we're all teachers and learners at the same time. You can only really teach what you know. So for me, I try to share my experience um, and what I've come to know and what I've come to learn to whoever I'm sharing that with, but also listen to learn myself from their experience, what they've learned, maybe, you know, uh, pick something up from from that as well. I forgot what the question was. Uh, in what ways do you pass on the knowledge that you carry? Yeah, and, and so what I do is I try to make every time I'm doing some kind of a exercise in teachings or whatever it might be, that I make it an experiential learning. So I have the ones who are sitting with me 
do something, not just sit and listen to me talk or, you know, that they share as well. But, you know, as an example, you know, learning about the medicine wheel. Well, there's a exercise or a, a session that I do where you make, we make, we sit and we make medicine wheels and you make your medicine wheel. You put yourself in the wheel where you are physically, where you are emotionally, mentally, spiritually, and you put your family in there, put your life in there in the different parts of your life as an infant, as a youth, as an adult, maybe a, as an elder or moving to that. When I work with people, rather than just talk about the wheel, I try to take them through it using their experience, their life, so they really get the feel for what that medicine wheel is, is about, or at least get some glimpse of it, some taste of it. Um, so for me, that's I find people learn better when they experience things than just intellectually reading a book or listening to someone talk. I find that maybe some pick up more, but I find everybody when you experience, when you go through an experiential type learning, that uh, you pick up more. You have a better understanding. So that's what I try to do. So look, thinking when we're thinking about Indigenous education, um, is there any specific type of like story or teaching that you feel is not only important for generations to understand, but for your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, that you want them to be able to know and hear about and live through? Well, that's, that's easy. That's the creation story. For, you know, every nation has a creation story, has their own creation story. We have ours. It, uh, in that story, it has everything. Everything that we, as Anishinaabe, as Indigenous people, that we believe, that we that we carry, um, that we learn, everything is in the, in the in that story. So that's in that one story. All other stories exist, but that's the first one. That's the one story that all Indigenous people should know is their creation story, because that. You know, that, that's the beginning. That's where things start. That's where thought started. That's, that's where everything began. And so it's important to know that story, know a version of that story, uh, because it, uh, it teaches us about ourselves, about why we think the way we do, why we behave the way we do, why we uh, are the way we are. And so... To me, that's the most important story to learn. And as Indigenous people, that's how we passed on our our teachings, was through storytelling. We didn't have computers or paper to write on, although we did you know, have scrolls and things that we did document. But um, overall, we shared and passed knowledge through storytelling. And within those stories were the teachings, were the beliefs. Um, and that's how we learned as well, was through through storytelling. So to me, the creation story is, is the one to, the first one everyone should have some some knowledge of. It's an option to share the story if you like, or we can bypass it. <laughs> if you feel comfortable or... Oh, if I can remember how it goes all <laughs> together. Um, let me see, we'll give it a shot. Okay. Uh, the story goes that, um, in, well, in, the, in our creation story, we like to call them chapters or fires. And they're the, the different stages of creation, when it began and where we are today and how we got here, how, how we got to where we are today. The story itself, when told properly, takes two or three days to tell. So I'm not going to sit here for a couple of days <laughs> telling it. I'll give you a short version of it. But it was said that uh, um, the way... And Anishinaabe or indigenous people believe is uh, it's our spirituality is not a religion it's it's a, a way of belief it's a way of living it's uh, it's a connection to creation and so the the, the creation story kind of helps um, helps uh, understand understand it in that way and it it goes by uh, these chapters of fires and it was said the very first fire in the beginning, the very first, before there was anything, before there was uh, the universe, the world, before there was anything, Gajemnado sat in the darkness. And 
the thought of creation came to him, the idea of creation, the the vision of all of this, what we see around us, what we're, what we live in today, came to him, and uh, it came as a as a spark, as a flash, was that first fire. And it's like that thought that comes into your head when you get an idea. There's like a spark. Scientists call that the Big Bang. When the Big Bang happened, was that thought. And when that thought happened, you know that that explosion in in. Uh, uh, in space, all of creation began to materialize. So that's how Western, or that's how science looks at it. Ours was that first thought. And that was the first fire. After that spark, after that thought came, then there was a second fire. And that was light. So that was all the, the creation from that, from that spark. All the stars, the suns in all of the universe lit up lit up all of creation. And that was the second fire. The third fire was um, the four directions, time and space. In order for the physical world to exist, we need time and space. We need a physical space, and we need time in order to walk through that physical realm, to move through it. <clears throat> the, fourth, uh, the fourth fire was uh, the twinness, the balance um, of creation, the, the night and day, the male, the female, the fire, the water, all of that balance needed to, uh, needed to be here for the physical world to exist. There was balance required. The fifth fire, the fifth fire was the earth. After everything was being made, the Creator needed a place for his thoughts of what the world was to look like. He needed a place for it to bounce off of, to send it to. So he began to mold the earth, our mother. So he created all, all the lakes and all the streams and everything, but nothing was alive yet. He just wanted that place to begin, to, to where life would begin. And the uh, sixth fire, sixth fire was life, was blowing when he took a Mika shell and he blew. After everything was made, he blew and created life. Life began to move. The, flower, the, the rivers began to flow. All of the creatures began to come alive. All of life began in the earth. And the seventh fire, the seventh fire was the human race, was us. After everything was created, after everything was perfect, we were placed here. Four colors, four children were placed here. The yellow, the black, the white, and the red. Each one were placed on the earth and sent off into different directions on the earth to multiply, to, to take up that space on the earth, to begin to, to live uh, and take care of this place. The last one that was lowered was the, the little red child, indigenous child. And that little child, when, when the child was lowered, kept coming back to the Creator. The Creator would send him off, and he kept coming back. He wouldn't leave. Finally, the Creator said, I'm going to give you a job, and I have this gift. I have this gift I want to give you to do that job. And it was the gift of tobacco was that first tobacco, that medicine that was passed to us. And the Creator asked that little child to take this tobacco as a gift, as, a, uh, as an offering to take care of this place, to help your brothers and sisters, those other colors, to help them. And that little child wanting to do a good job took, took that tobacco and accepted that, and which is why as Indigenous people we're we're very close to the earth. We're very close to the Creator. We never want to leave the Creator. We never want to be too far from, from creation. And so that, that gift of tobacco was that very first offering. And so by honoring that gift, when we ask someone of something, we always offer them that tobacco from that first gift we received, from that first medicine we received. We also offer that to others to help do the work that needs to be done. 
that version of the creation story is, there's many versions. There's many creation stories. And if ever asked which creation story is true, they're all true. All creation stories are true. They're true because it's not the words that, that, that describe the story or the story itself. It's what's in the story, the teachings in it, in each story is, is what is constant in all creation stories and is what is, is important. So each nation carries their creation stories. We have ours. All these creation stories should be the first thing that all, all children uh, are taught uh, when they come into this world because it helps them understand where they come from and in part what part of their purpose is here to take care of this place and to find their space, find their path through the physical world <clears throat> so that they can honor that sama, that tobacco, the, the gift of life, the gifts uh, that have been placed here on the earth. So that's that's my version of the creation story that uh, that I uh, that I know. Each time I tell it, I tell it different. Each time I hear it, I hear it different. The words might vary, but the spirit of the story is the same. The gifts in those story in that story is the same each time. It's just told a different way, a different language, um, a different time, but it's the spirit is constant. Uh, going back uh, to topic of indigenous education, uh, what, do you, what do you envision for indigenous education over the next 10 years? What I envision and what I hope are <laughs> two different <laughs> things, but my hope and my vision, I see somewhat coming together. I see indigenous education, first of all, being taught by indigenous people, being uh, written, being the curriculum, the all of that, I see the stories, the ceremonies, the teachings being a part of that curriculum. I see more of that. It's part of what I hope to see it continue to go in. I hope to see Indigenous education become mainstream education so that it's not just for Indigenous uh, learners, it's for all, all learners because in order to, for all those four children to to work together, to get along, to understand each other, we have to share each other's stories. We have to understand, you know, what instructions each of us were given by the Creator uh, so that we can work together. So I see Indigenous education as a, as a priority, whether it is that or becomes that, I don't know, we'll see. But uh, my hopes is, is that it continues on the path that it seems to be going on, where we are uh, the caretakers of our own uh, education, our own history, our own stories, and that we're able to pass it on in a proper way and that it continues to be shared by us and continues to grow and uh, find its place. Are there ways or methods that you think we, as both myself, researcher, future educator, can help support that vision? Well, I think a big, a big part of it is getting back to the land. Our mother is our first teacher. And I don't mean just when you're born, because that is true. Your, your mother is your first teacher. Our mother, the earth, is our first teacher. We need to get back to uh, uh, more land-based um, experiences and uh, land-based learning to really, I think, engage and, and, and learn that indigenous uh, perspective, uh, indigenous education. It's not just intellectual, it's not just in the classroom, it's not just uh, internet and Google, um, it's, uh, it's experiencing things, it's uh, being out on the land and the water. Um, so I hope that, you know, in Indigenous education continues to uh, include that uh, more, um, finding a way to do it that uh, engages the student, that reconnects to the learner to, to the land, to the water, to creation, because that's where the real learning uh, happens, I think, anyway.